Hey, everybody. Welcome to Perpetual Motion, a podcast focused on self-care, communication, and positive relationships. I'm your host, Dr. Mo Anderson. Each episode, I interview thought leaders from all over the world who share tips and tools to add immediate value to your personal growth. And my guest today is Kyle Perry, a United States Marine Corps veteran and certified master personal trainer who lost one hundred one. That's two zeros. One hundred pounds after getting sober. Now he is a lifestyle, fitness and nutrition coach, helping veterans and others become stronger in both their minds and bodies. If that sounds good to you, those are bucket list items, then you want to stay tuned because this is going to be a dope episode. Welcome, Kyle. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's my pleasure. After you reached out to me and I saw your Insta, I don't know if we call it ripped or shredded or, you know, I'm not in the bodybuilding like that. But, y'all, I got to tell y'all, he looks the part. He's not just talking it. He looks the part. So I know you're practicing what you teach. Uh, let's start. Let's start back in the early years. Your bio, Cal, says you grew up in challenging circumstances and you thought joining the Marines would change you and save your life, but nothing happened. What was life like growing up for you and why didn't joining the Marine Corps make a, make the difference you expected? So the area I grew up in, the crime rate's pretty high and it's pretty easy to fall victim to getting in trouble with your friends. Like my brother, he's really successful now, but he's a five-time felon mm -hmm. and I try. I thought leaving for the Marine Corps would actually, you know, get save me from trouble. But the thing is, you can't run away from the mindset you've already built. You have to start working on yourself. So okay. when you go to the military, you kind of start to hang out with like-minded people. So you fit in and you feel like you're still part of something and you like relate to those people. So mm -hmm. the same people that ran from their troubles, we all hung out together. So then I was still getting in trouble. Um, there was this point in time where I almost got like a kidnapping charge and breaking and entering while I was in the military over a fight oh, that wow. happened and we went to someone's house. And that was the same type of stuff cool. I was doing back home. So nothing changed. I was just now in the military, which is even more trouble because you get punished out in the real world. Then you get punished mm -hmm. in the military as well. Thankfully, nothing came of it. But um, that was kind of like one of my first wake up calls where like I need to start working on myself. I was drunk per the usual. Anytime I touched alcohol, I really, uh, my anger would spiral out of control. Mm. Um, and the military is very, a very drinking state. Like everyone drinks and like you celebrate with drinking, you have going aways with drinking. So I didn't change my mindset. It took me a couple years after I got out of the military to finally like, this is, I need to stop trying to dodge all these bullets and just get my life completely together. Gotcha. Gotcha. And in addition to celebration, I suspect some of that drinking was also self-medication, uh, dealing with the things they brought from outside of the military and then stress. I don't know if you were in combat, but uh, there's a lot going on right now for our soldiers. Thank you for your service, by the way. And uh, that's a great point about the same people being there. You know, I, I wanted you to share that because so often we try to run from our troubles. You know, if I join this organization, if I go to church all the time, if, you know, all these external things, but you said the key word is your mindset. So, Kyle, what was the turning point that made you realize your life had to change? I'm wondering if there was an incident or was it just overall you weren't happy with where you were in life? There was, I had already started working on myself, but I was still doing this thing where I would casually drink. And there was two different incidents that like led up to where I wanted to be completely sober and cut alcohol all the way out of my life. One smaller incident, my daughter looked at the fireball when we were at Sam's Club and was like, Daddy, that's your favorite drink. Oh and the goodness. fact that my six-year-old daughter knew my favorite drink was too much mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had already quit drinking. I was on the verge of like, I might drink here and there. But that was like the final, like, I'm not drinking anymore. And then there was like an altercation, a physical altercation that happened um, when I was on a cruise. So I went to Miami. This girl was like talking really crazy to my wife and i told her husband i'm like if you don't tell your wife to calm down like i'm gonna we're gonna have a problem and then we ended up getting in a physical altercation 
Mm-hmm. He somewhat got hurt. We're on the cruise the next day. They're on the cruise ship with us, and the cruise ship has to turn around for emergency. Some Somebody had some issue with their uh, internal bleeding. So in my head, I'm thinking, like, this dude, because he hit his head really hard. And I'm like, this dude has internal bleeding. Like, is something wrong with his brain? I'm, like, freaking out. An hour later, I saw him. So thank God it wasn't him. And uh, yeah. we talked after that. But, like, that was, like, my final wake-up call. Like, this is the last bullet I can dodge before something serious happens. So, um that was like my real, real, like hard wake up call right there. And I haven't, mm-hmm. I haven't touched alcohol since. Wow. It, it's amazing how in tune our children can be with us and how much they're noticing that we don't even realize. Uh, yeah, I've, I've had my kids help me with some turning points as well. Cause they see right through all the BS. I tell you, it's, it's crazy. So I, I want to stay on this uh, sobriety, so, sober thing, the, the journey you've been on. And because particularly after 2020, it's become such a problem for so many more people, not just men, but women as well. That was just such a trying time. And we have so many excuses for drinking alcohol, right? Like, oh, it's day. It's a new day. So we celebrate by day drinking meeting our friends for a happy hour, or we survived another work week and, you know, we're going to turn up. No one, I don't think anyone intends to become addicted, but it's a slippery slope with so much going on to stress us out. How do you start breaking these habits and abstaining from drugs, alcohol, or other addictive substances? So per the American definition, I, they, the people that were drinking as much as me probably wouldn't call themselves an alcoholic. But mm-hmm. in my mind, in a lot of people's minds, if you have to rely on alcohol to have fun, that is a form of an addiction. I don't, even if it doesn't control your life, if you have to control your emotions to feel better out in public, that is a mm-hmm. form of addiction. Food's an addiction. Mm-hmm. Alcohol's an addiction. Anything, any vice you use to change your emotional state of mind, even if it's vaping or nicotine, something that's not even that as, as serious – is it's still an addiction. So the first thing you have to do is admit to yourself, you're masking your emotions and you're creating a new person with that substance. So you are an addict of some kind, even if it's just food, you're a food addict. If you have to eat because you had a bad day at work. So you have to internalize that you are the problem and then that you're also the solution. Anything that you've created in life has ultimately been from a choice you made. You either went this way or this way with the choice. And every single choice you make has a reaction, whether it's good or bad. And if you're overweight, you're out of shape, you don't like your career, your relationship's bad, every choice you made made that happen. There's some outliers that happen, but the way you react to that outlier is still a choice that you made that affected your life. So you still have to internalize you're the original problem, and it starts with you. So many people point fingers at all. Well, this is like, I could be like, this is a bad area. All my friends are dead or in prison. Like I'm still doing better than them, even though I'm drinking. I used to do that all the time. Like my friends died from drugs. I just drink. I used to just, I would downplay the drinking part. And that's what most Americans or most people in society do is they downplay the bad choices they're making because someone else made a worse choice than them. So it always starts with you and internally how you think about the situation. Because there's people that only have three or four drinks a week, but that is still a form of an addiction because you're using that to calm down. If you use it to calm anything down or change your state of mind, I don't care if it's one drink or 30 drinks, it's still an an addictive state. Mm, That's deep. That's deep. And you had some good analogies there. I want to go back to, I'm glad you mentioned food because it's an addiction. We, I mean, we talk about weight loss programs, but we don't talk about the mental emotional aspect of it as much as we probably should with food addiction. I'm wondering if you, if you can tell me what's the difference between someone who simply enjoys good food or fine dining and someone with a food addiction. I, I know you said it might alter your state, but how, do, how does food do that? I get it with alcohol and the other drugs. How does food do that? So when it comes to food, a lot of people, this is a, there's two states to this one, people will say they got sober, but then they're 300 pounds overweight. You didn't get sober. You switched your addiction. So you created a different habit that was still bad. And uh, when it comes to food, if you've ever seen someone that's having a bad day, they go home and they order a pizza because they don't feel like cooking. So you use that comfort food to change your day. 
You thought the food was going to change your state of mind, but it's really going to do the opposite and make it worse. Because if you don't treat your body like the temple is supposed to be, your emotional state of mind. So many people will come and argue the fact that it doesn't matter if you're over, overweight, you could still be successful. But why is depression and anxiety at an all-time high right now when food and alcohol is at the highest intake it's ever been. It correlates. If you look at anxiety, depression, and suicidal rates, it goes up with our intake of food and it goes up with our intake of alcohol. And food is, I think food may be worse because no one talks about it. Everyone goes and eats all these fast foods. They're overweight. And then I had a friend that was 35 years old. He thankfully didn't die, but he had a massive heart attack. We shouldn't be having massive heart attacks in thir at 30 years old. Science has improved so much, we shouldn't be dying at 30 anymore. We can live to 100 and something now. But we are so prideful as Americans, like, oh, we work hard, we got to play hard, and it's killing us. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Those, those are all good points and, and something to think about, switching one addiction for another. Wow. Um, to that end, and we're going we're gonna to get to exercise, but <laughs> there are a lot of diet and weight loss programs. I mean, every other commercial that comes on television is about a drug or a new diet, especially right now, as we record this, we're headed into a new year. What diet or type of diet do you recommend for someone trying to get healthier? So I always start off with mindset first. They have to tell themselves they want the change or it won't work. And the, the, mm -hmm. the next part is you just have to work on portion control and tracking your macros and your macros are your proteins, carbs, and fats. You want to keep the ratio at 40, 40, 20. It really won't make a lot of sense if you don't know what your macros are, your, what they are. But mm -hmm. you want to have X amount of protein, X amount of carbs, and X amount of fats. And you want to use a tracking app. The one I use is called Trainist. Uh, you, if you go to my Instagram and message me, I'll just send you the link. It's absolutely free. It's one of the only free tracking apps that you can customize your macros and not have to pay for it. And you need to use a food scale so that way you can start to visualize what portion sizes are. Because I have people all the time, they're like, well, I only had one serving of peanut butter, but the, the spoon was this full. It's really six servings. Right. So now they've had like 70 grams of fat. And a lot of people don't realize what portions are. So you really want to just start tracking your foods and you want to start – you don't have to have 100% clean foods all the time. You can have foods you enjoy and that you love because you want this to be a sustainable long-term approach. Like That's why the diet industry is a billion-dollar industry because they sell you one quick fix and then they sell you a different quick fix. So they want you to balk with these balking supplements and they want you to cut with these cutting supplements, but they never tell you about the diet part. If you just slowly build better habits over time, you'll never put the weight back on. So you learn how what portion control is. You learn what four ounces of protein looks like. You learn what 1,800 calories a day feels like. And then you slowly just start to build better habits. You swap out your real pop with like uh, zeros. And then you just start slowly transitioning things into better choices. Like people will overcomplicate it and they're like, well, Coke Zero is what causes cancer. Like overeating causes cancer. It's, it's proven fact if you're obese, you can have, you're at a higher risk for cancer. So you might as well swap out one for the other to get your weight down. And then you can cut that stuff out if you absolutely don't want it. Right. And I would imagine that, uh, you know, the labels really throw us off too because they do a lot of trickery there. So people are like, oh, I got these chips. They're low fat, this and that. Forget all the other junk in them. But a serving is three chips. If you really <laughs> read the label and you just say this big giant bag <laughs> yeah. while you're sitting there numbing yourself watching TV and eating this crunchy, salty food. So, you know, I don't know that we can change that, but I, I also think it's important for people to look at labels while they're learning, you know, about nutrients. And once I did that, I would pick up something and just be appalled at the sodium and the sugar and, and all the stuff that was in it that I thought was healthy. Um, do you have any thoughts on fast food, processed food versus uh, fruits and vegetables? It's always better to get all your foods from clean foods, whole foods, because Mm -hmm. your body will look completely different. I know that. So your body will lose weight. I actually changed my tune on this within the last couple of years. Your body will lose weight no matter what you eat if you're in a calorie deficit, but your body will not look the same over those 12 weeks. The person that ate Twinkies and lost weight will be skinny fat. The person that <laughs> ate good protein, good carbs, and good fats for those 12 weeks will have a more muscular recomp when they're done with those 12 weeks. So they'll look more masculine. They'll look more, or even like females, they'll look, they'll look more like they're supposed to 
versus mm-hmm. if they were eating junk and not working. Because foods throw off your hormones, whether people want to admit it or not. So if you can optimize your hormones as a female or a male, you will look better at that part when you're actually using the foods to optimize your hormones. Okay. Now I, I hear the ladies in my head, the women listening to this, they're going to want to know what you mean by women will look more like they're supposed to. So I'm asking on their behalf, what does that So like if you is? notice when people, they start, they have like a starvation diet, they look like skinny fat. So you mm-hmm. won't have like, like a lot of girls, like they want like a bigger butt. So they'll lose that because they starve themselves. So like you mm-hmm. actually have the build that you want to have. Like if you pick, close your eyes and picture your dream physique, if you ate whole foods and you focused on a long-term goal, you would get to that dream physique. If you starved yourself, you're going to look like a, a skinny, a skinny fat version of that dream physique you think you want. You're not getting to the place you want to go by starving yourself and not eating the correct foods. Right. And we've all seen that, that kind of anorexic look. And it's funny because mm-hmm. the people think they look so great and you're looking at them like, oh, you need to eat. <laughs> so yeah. Please yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. You don't, you don't need a BBL if you do this right. Gotcha. Well, it's clear that mindset and, and diet are important, but you also have to exercise to lose weight it, as we're talking about. Your Insta Cal is full of photos showing how ripped you are today. What are some of your top workout or cardio tips to lose fat and tone up the body? So I have a bad back from the military, so I can't run. So what I do is, and this is probably one of the most mental clarity building exercises also, is I ruck. So I take a backpack, I put 45 pounds in it, and I walk with it. It's very low impact. You don't start with 45 pounds, especially, obviously, if I'm a 200-pound male and you're a 110-pound female, you don't want to do the same weight I'm doing. You want to start with what's comfortable with you, so like maybe 10 pounds, and you work your way up to whatever you're comfortable with. And rucking builds an ex- or it burns an extreme amount of calories compared to just walking alone. And it helps build your posture because you're holding a backpack. It's pushing you back forward. So you're, you're working on your posture, you're stabilizing your core, and you're burning calories. And if you go outside and you ruck in the wilderness or outside and you look at all the surroundings and you're just rucking with this weight that you really don't want to do, you build a lot of mental fortitude and you get a lot of mental clarity and you can talk to yourself and push yourself past those limits. So I'm a big fan of rucking. It's low impact. It doesn't hurt your knees like running. And it burns three times more calories than just walking alone because you add all the weight. You have to use your stabilizer muscles. You're using, you're engaging your legs more. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest thing I would tell people. You would start with walking and then work your way up to rucking. But there is no specific fat burning exercise. You just find things that you like. Like let's say you tried the rucking, you didn't like it. Try to row, try to swim, find something you enjoy because it has to be a lifelong journey. Okay. And the things you're describing are kind of total body movement things because a lot of people just want to focus on the weight lifting, the free weights or the machines, but that cardio aspect is important as well, right? Yeah. You got to put cardio first. Like I go to the gym six days a week, but cardio is always a main staple because you like our heart is our best muscle that you want to protect. So if you can't, yes. I hate when I hear a fitness coach say, let me teach you how to lose weight without cardio. Like, what do you, you're not, where's the heart health coming in? Where's the actual health coming into the coaching you're supposed to be doing? Like I, I build people gym exercises, but I always tell them the first thing they need to do when they start trying to lose weight is just walk. You just need to get your body. We're meant to walk. We're not supposed to be like cars just got invented with yeah. that in the last couple hundred years. Like we used to have to walk to work. We had to walk to our friend's house, mm-hmm. walk to the store, walk to school. And uh, we don't do that anymore. And that's why we die so early because movement is key to, to longevity. And and I'm going to say that that's a Western thing, too, when you say we don't walk, because when I travel south, north, other countries, you don't see the obesity that you see here. And you see people walking, walking and using mass transit, which helps with the, uh, you know, environment. But, yes, that walking is is so critical. I think I think about my grandmothers who walked and farmed and did everything. They didn't have a big workout program, but they all you know, lived long lives, healthy, muscle tone, mind was right. So um, I do want you to spell rucking though, because I've never even heard that word before. But now that you describe it, I've seen people doing it, but I thought they were trying to be firemen or something. I didn't know why they were walking around the backpack. <laughs> it's rucking, or you can call it backpacking, whatever it is, uh, R-U-C-K-I-N-G. So it's, and then if you want to buy like super nice equipment, there's this website called goruck.com. They sell backpacks, the weighted, the weighted plates and stuff like that. Um, 
And one thing about the the culture you were talking about, if you think about it, I've never seen an overweight or fat Amish person. And mm. that's because they don't live life like us. And uh, right, right. Uh, there's another thing where people will be like, well, because I was talking about the skinny fat thing, but there's also a lot of misinformation out there like, well, I'm not losing weight because I'm, uh, I'm eating too little calories. That's not a thing. If that was a thing, um, somebody on Naked and Afraid would have gained weight. Um, <laughs> you would go in the history books where there was uh, concentration camps and you would see one fat person and at least some of those pictures. And I know that's a grotesque way to look at things and that's kind of a bad event, but it's true. Yeah, and I, like, I'm all those not people laughing got at <laughs> If right. all those people got starved, how come not one of them got fatter? Um, mm. So there's just a lot of misinformation out there that confuses people. And that's why a lot of people are overweight because they think like, oh, I really am eating 1,500 calories, but they're not. Like we go back to the peanut butter thing I talked about. They're, they think in their head they're not losing weight because they're eating too few of calories, but it all has to do with the calorie surplus every single time. Well, the other thing I hear from people a lot is that it's genetics. You know, I, mm -hmm. I come from big people, big bone people, but your analogy, and I certainly wasn't laughing at people in concentration camps. It was just the thought of, you know, seeing a large person there. I want to put that yeah. out there to be clear. That was, you know. No, but, but uh, it sounds funny when you say it, though, right? Like, if you're right, like, why is there? Because then it wakes people up. They're like, oh, that makes sense. And yeah. uh I, so there is a, a genetic factor into it. So let's say me and you both are dieting, right? There's this thing called ghrelin and your ghrelin is your hunger hormone. So it can go up and down. And the more you diet, the higher your ghrelin gets and you feel hungrier. Well, your ghrelin could start like kicking, like just destroying you at 22% body fat. You could feel hungry all the time. It might, might not kick in and start making me feel hungry until I get to like 7%. So there is a factor in genetics, but the thing is, those are just the cards you were dealt, and that was the hand that life played you. You have to be able to beat those, because either way, you're going to have to deal with it for the rest of your life. So you have to just admit, maybe I don't have genetics as good as the next person, but I can still get in shape as long as I tell myself, hunger isn't a bad thing. Hunger is the feeling of fat burn and discipline, and if I can get past the state of thinking hunger is a bad thing, from the dawn of time, even in the Bible, they talk about fasting and that, how that can spiritually awaken you and that can get you the results you want. So hunger has been talked about and there's always been a thing where you should be hungry to like be closer to God, get to your goals. But within like the last 10 to 20 years, we make it sound like if you're hungry, it's a horrible thing. I'm like, I feel so much more motivated when I'm hungry because my I'm so much more alert. Hmm. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. That's interesting. Good point you make. So I want to switch over now to uh, <laughs> your coaching. And uh, like I said, your Insta, you've got lots of great videos. I love how much you share uh, openly and freely. And one of the things that you talk about is that you want to bring masculinity back to the forefront. I'd like for you to explain what masculinity is. I think there's some confusion about that. And what it is not. So masculinity to me, I think masculinity isn't toxic. I think the lack of masculinity is when you have men that beat women, when you have men that do grotesque things in society, when you have men that shoot up places and they kill kids, they don't have any masculinity. They're not comfortable with themselves. A real masculine man carries themselves in a way where he can protect his family. He can protect himself. He, he carries a, like when, when I walk into a room, I have complete confidence that 95% of the time, I'm a harder worker than yeah. everyone around me because I know how early I wake up. Yeah. I know the life I live. I know I live life how I talk. I'm normally the best per shaped person in the room, which I used to be the worst shaped person in the room. And you can see it in other men's eyes and other people's eyes. They automatically have a hesitation towards you sometimes because your presence makes them feel like they weren't, they're not doing something right. And then they kind of like, we all, we all see it in today's society. The thin shape person gets bashed and the fat dude with his shirt off talking about how he loves himself gets praised. It's like we went down the wrong tube in Mario and we're in backwards land. <laughs> so the people that actually live life like we're supposed to, like protecting the women, the women had to step up in today's society because there's so many weak men. And it's just this big giant shift in the, this, this pendulum. And like, it's getting... It seems like it's switching back the other way, but to be a masculine man, you just have to actually live life by your words. There's so many men that talk about how they're this and how they're hard workers and how 
they can provide for their family. But when you look at them and you look deep into their core, you tell, you can tell they don't live the life they speak. And it's not always about being violent and being dangerous, but if you see a man and he's 50, 60, 70 pounds overweight, and you think about his family getting attacked, even if he could defend him for 10 seconds, he's going to be so out of breath. He's, he might lose that fight. And we're living in a very violent time. There's shootings everywhere. There's people attacking other people. Like, I don't think you should ever enact violence first, but you have to be able to defend your homestead and yourself and the people around you. And you can't do that out of shape, smoking, drinking, being a feminine man. I don't, I, like, you should have feminine traits. Like, I have a very sensitive side for my daughters, but that doesn't mean I'm a feminine man. I still carry myself very just... I protect my family. I really love my country because I served for the country. And it's just like we're like they want us to be ashamed of being proud of being a man. And men are what built this country to begin with. And it's what protects this country when we go to real war. All these people talking all this crazy nonsense trying to cancel people on the internet, they're not even gonna leave their houses when the if another war breaks out. They're gonna be the ones that are ne- that they're not talking anymore. They're scared. They're hiding in their homes. They're not helping. They're going to go let all these strong men die, and they're mm-hmm. never going to step up to the plate. And that's what masculinity means to me. And people say toxic masculinity, but I believe it's the other way around. The men that don't have that masculine side of themselves and aren't comfortable with themselves are the worst men you can see you could ever meet. Yeah, and I, I do. I've read and I've seen that a lot of the physical abuse of women and and children is because of a lack within that man. And that is not the way to prove that you're a real man is to hit on women and children. I I hate that. And you're right. That, that is indeed toxic. So when you coach your clients, I mean, how do they, do they just hear you talking about this and realize, Hey, I need some help in this area. Or how do you even, reach people to realize that this aspect of, of being a man of their lifestyle is important to work on and develop that it, you know, doesn't just happen for everyone. So I make very offensive content on purpose. Um, if anybody watches my Instagram, I'm like, Hey, you're fat because of your choices. Like I start my videos off like that. It's going to push some people away, but I didn't want those clients anyways, because they weren't going to be able to be coachable. If you can't if you can't admit you're fat from your choices, I can't help you. If you can't admit your relationship's bad because you're not putting in the work, I can't help you. Or that you have that job because your work ethic's not hard enough, I can't help you. It has to internalize here. So I say very offensive things to where somebody's on the edge to where they want to change their life and they're like, I feel like that really, really resonated with me and he's speaking to me directly. I get at least two, three messages a day. Like I felt your video was literally directed towards me and that's the whole point. I'm trying to reach the old me. So I speak to the old me two years ago, three years ago that made good money and thought that money was how I should, like I like provided for my family. But financial, financial success is only one pillar of being a great father and husband. You you can't just provide money like you have to provide value. You have to set the standard. You have to provide discipline. You have to provide love. You have to provide being the example and setting the example to teach them and lead them in the right direction. Money doesn't do any of that. If anything, it kind of takes it. If you have money without a good mindset, it will ruin you before it ever make your life better. Yeah. Yeah. We've all, we've all seen that giving, giving people money doesn't make them classy, sophisticated, a good leader, anything. It just gives them money to be a bigger butthole if that's what they were in the first place. I I love what you said too, about being that leader for the family, because a lot of women, like you said, are having to step up because we don't feel safe. I need to feel safe. If you want to lead and and make decisions or we're going to collaborate. I need to know that you invested and accountable and you're going to be reliable and follow through. And if we don't see that, then yeah, we're going to step up and be more aggressive because, you know, we we're concerned about our families. We're concerned about our lives as well. And, and I hear a lot of guys talking about how women are, you know, getting more like men and stuff. Now it's like, well, somebody got to do it, bro. (laughs) Exactly. Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to be the leader and the protector. And if the man's not going to do it, it's human nature that somebody has to do it. So if the man's not going to do it, the woman's going to step up and do it. And so many, 
that's the only that's the one thing I hate about today's culture is like it feels like they're we're pushing men and women apart when it takes two to build a great a great foundation. Yes. It and like it like when I was having relationship issues, like yeah, it wasn't just me; it was my wife. But like the thing is, people they don't ever like internalize their part first, and then like, hey, I want you to work on this. I'm going to work on this. They just start pointing right. the fingers, and that's what society does. Like they're like, well, women are doing this now, and women are doing this. Like there's a lot of hate right now. A lot of men are like, well, all these women are on OnlyFans. Like, where do you think the customers are at? It's the men. <laughs> the, the weak men are buying it. So be mad at the men that are giving them the, it would be crazy for a woman to turn down $50,000 a month because there's a bunch of weak men out there. So you can't even hate on those women because the men made the foundation for it. There, and there, there's a market for it. It's supply if, the, if there was no market for it, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. Exactly. Exactly. And we will end this wonderful discussion on those well, point salient points that everyone can uh think about as we go into and and i say a new year starts every day so it doesn't matter that right now we're at the end of december if you want to change your life if you want to change the trajectory and the course you're on a new year starts every day a new year starts every day so kyle you have been amazing i love your insight and the points you've shared so please tell everyone if they want to know more how to connect with you online and learn more about your programs and offerings so everything's just through my instagram perry's underscore powerhouse underscore fitness and if you ever reach out it's me i don't have any sales people i don't have any setters closers none of that we just talk about your life and if i can actually change your life or not and um, if you haven't internalized, you're the problem. I just I can't help you. I, I could charge you a billion dollars, and you still wouldn't fix yourself. You have to internalize that it's you first before you reach out to someone. All right, folks, and that's how you know he really wants to help you because he will turn you down if you don't have your mind right. And that's not something you hear from a lot of coaches. But I respect that, and I'm I'm the same way. If you're not, if you don't have the mindset, and you're not ready to do the work, you're going to be wasting my time, and that's not worth any amount of money wasting your time and mine. So. Thank you so much. We'll put all of that into the show notes. Uh, really appreciate what you're doing and keep up the great work. And folks, we hope you'll join us again next week for another exciting, informative episode of Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson. You can learn more about me and my services on my website at drmoanderson.com. Until next time, be well and be safe. Thank you, Cal. Thank you.